Hello, and welcome to Scale Up Security 2021. I'm Eric Thomas, Vice President of Security Go-To-Market for Logs.io, and I will be your host and MC for today's event. I want to tell you what's on the agenda. So this is a 90-minute event, more or less, featuring four very cool, very interesting presentations. Up first, we have Jonah Cowell, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Logs.io, talking about company vision. After Jonah, you're going to hear from Oded Venunu, who's Head of Products Vulnerability Research at Checkpoint Software. He's going to be talking about cybercrime syndicates. After Oded, we've got Milind Dadari, Information Security Engineer at the Associated Press, uh, who's going to talk about how they adopted Logs.io and how they're using the product. Uh, and a quick demo from Ashley Somerville. She's a Senior Customer Success Engineer at Logs.io, showing some of the features that, that Milind uses. Last up, uh, maybe most importantly, my conversation with Smidar Paradise. She's the Director of Product Management at Logs.io, and she will be taking a look at the product roadmap for 2021. Our live chat is open. Please post with kindness. Feel free to ask questions and make comments. We'll be there to, to answer any questions. For those of you who are looking for more information, there's a book a meeting button at the top of the event page. The live operator standing by to book a meeting with us. We've also added some content to the main event page, including a video about our new integration with Simplify, which is a SOAR company, you know, kind of like Demisto. And we're gonna be running a few giveaways today as well. I'll ask a question in the chat and the first person to answer correctly via the chat will win a prize. And with that, let's get right to it. Up first is Jonah Cowell, CTO at Logs.io. And in this session, Jonah is going to share his vision for cloud security. Without further ado, here's Jonah. <laughs> Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. My name is Jonah Cowell. I'm the CTO here at logs.io and uh, looking forward to this dis discussing this really exciting new stuff that we're doing. Our first conference on security, Scale Up Your Security. I'd like to talk a little bit about our vision, strategy, and direction for the cloud sim and what we're building for teams that are really focused on securing their environments and how they want to do so with open source technologies. Uh, so as I go through this and I kind of explain some of where we're going, hopefully this will resonate with you, maybe get you to think differently about your organization and some of the things that you're grappling with. So. Uh, thanks for tuning in and uh, look forward to getting any feedback from you too. So as we kick things off, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about the company and who we are. Uh, Logs.io started in Tel Aviv. That's our headquarters uh, where most of our employees are. Our second biggest office is in Boston in the US. And we have our own offices uh, for engineering in Kiev. We have a, a handful of people, a growing office there and in the UK and London. Uh, some of our logos down below and uh, some of the awards that we've gotten recently talking about our, our awesome product. Uh, you can hear it from customers. It's always great that we don't have to talk about what we do and how we do it and our customers instead deliver that message. Uh, we have over 230 employees and we're getting pretty close to a thousand customers. Uh, so looking forward to that milestone. Uh, so the challenge that we hear time and time again and why we built the cloud sim product is really that today's sims are legacy and they're, they're very challenging to run and operate. So what we've seen over the last year is all of us, just like me, working at home um, and we all deal with new challenges. We have new technologies that we're using, more and more cloud, more and more of a distributed workforce. And so 32% of respondents are seeing an increased number of cybersecurity attacks. That's the net result of what we've seen uh, transpire over the last year. Similarly, more and more folks are implementing public cloud and, uh, and most people run in a hybrid mode today. So this introduces new scalability challenges for SIMs that are generally built in a specific uh, you know, with a specific set of hardware or specific components, uh, because when your environment scales, it's hard to scale the SIM too. Uh, finally, the data sources are a big challenge and we'll talk about that here in a minute. So Gartner stated in the last SIM Magic Quadrant that they believe that most people are gonna be buying cloud SIM 
uh, in a cloud native delivered service. And when you take a look at the Magic Quadrant, which I don't have up here today, uh, none of the vendors in that leader quadrant are delivering a cloud native SIM. Uh, there's really only one other company that's doing what we're doing in this market, and we believe that there's going to be a, a strong trend towards that for many different reasons. Um, and some of the reasons are that, that these other products were designed for a different time and a different type of infrastructure and application. Uh, so today it's hard to ingest cloud data into SIMS, uh, something that obviously we do natively in our product. It's what most of our customers are doing. And most of them are bound by a single data center. So they're designed to be implemented in one place. They generally are designed to work for a single team and scalability is a big problem. Uh, so these are some of the things that, that we that we wanted to specifically uh, fix when we built our product. And you hear this term thrown around a lot, cloud native. Uh, just wanted to spend a minute defining what this means. So uh, obviously the cloud native computing foundation is one of the, the core uh, organizations that created cloud native. And Cloud Native Computing Foundation is part of the Linux Foundation. It's an open source software consortium. And it specifically was built around Kubernetes. When Google donated Kubernetes to the community, uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation took that technology and then they started assembling a bunch of open source around Kubernetes. And the beauty of these projects is that they're there's many, many of them. There's always more going into the CNCF. Uh, they're accessible by anyone. They're driven by the community. No single vendor controls them. Uh, they're very pluggable and flexible. Um, and we really, and, and they interoperate with the one another. So when you deploy Kubernetes, you get all of these other services that can easily plug on top of it. So that's what cloud native means. That's how Logs.io is built. That's how data collection is going to be done in the future. And uh, you know, this is where we've staked uh, the path of, of the organization. And we think that your teams, if they're not already down this path, like most of you are, they're going to be in the next year or two. So your tools have to change too. And with these accelerated challenges that we've seen in 2020, is that we're seeing a lot more people taking advantage of the current situation, which is that there's a lot of misinformation, there's people trying to capitalize on what we've all gone through in the last year. And uh, that means that there's more hackers, there's more people trying to compromise your organization, uh, new types of threats emerging. And, uh, and it takes a long time to track these down. We have lots of customers that see a breach and it takes them often uh, weeks, if not months, to even realize the problem has happened. A uh, great example is obviously the, the solar winds debacle that's gone on this year. Um, you know, it, it took a very long time to identify that there was even an issue occurring. And as we do more forensics on what happened, we start uncovering more and more information. Uh, even in the past week, you'll see new data is always emerging on what happened with sunburst and, and you know how that occurred. Um, the other big challenge over here on the bottom right is that most of us are trying to hire cybersecurity professionals. I can tell you that we are at logs.io. Uh, you probably are in your teams too. Uh, this is something that's likely not going to change anytime soon. Uh, there is a lot of demand for talent and there's a limited pool. Um, so uh, we've actually been training engineers to uh, take and learn security expertise, uh, but we also are obviously trying to hire. This is a problem that, uh, that most of you I'm sure are facing. And we have an answer for this, and I'll, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do to help augment the capabilities of your team. The other thing, this is a bit further down the horizon. We, we see trends of this happening but DevSecOps is going to happen at some point in, in my lifetime, <laughs> I hope. Uh, and that's really that security becomes part of development and operations. It becomes something that they're responsible for, that they wake up in the morning thinking about and they go to bed at night solving. 
and generalists in DevSecOps, they need these tools that can understand multiple domains of development, operations, and security. And they have to be easy to implement. They use existing data sets uh, and augment them with security data. Um, and then, of course, a lot of AI and ML to surface problems, issues, threats, and other compromises that are occurring. And so we believe that this is where things are going. We've built a platform that addresses these needs. Um, and, uh, you know, we see more and more of our customers going down this path, but it's still really small amount of those customers. Hopefully that'll change. I think it will. So what we deliver is a uh, cloud native SIM. That's a software as a service uh, technology. But we, we deliver a lot of expertise with that. And the expertise is not only in the product, but it's there to help you along with your journey. And so in our platform as a whole, I'm starting off on the left hand side here, uh, we use open source technologies to collect data. We don't have proprietary agents, proprietary technologies at all. We interface with APIs, we use a lot of open source data collection. We bring that into our platform, and you're going to hear more about this throughout the, uh, the day's uh, event, but um, we correlate this data together. We enrich it with threat feeds. We do filtering. We do other types of enrichment. You can actually incorporate your own enrichment into our platform. We bring all this data together. Uh, we store it. We provide AI and ML around that that I'll talk about in a moment. And then we deliver four distinct products over here on the right. We do log management, which is your typical log analytics, log search, log storage. That's where the company started. We then, and this is based on, uh, on the open source Kibana technology, and we use Elasticsearch as well underneath our, uh, our engine, our system. Uh, we built a cloud sim on top of Kibana as well. It's a lot of other technologies and capabilities, things like alerting, threat intelligence, lots of other things that we've created and the content to drive that so that it all works out of the box at scale. And then finally, we do infrastructure monitoring based on Prometheus and we do distributed tracing based on Jaeger. So all open source technologies brought together in an easy to consume manner. That's really what we deliver in our products. And we run this in a way where it's multi-region, multi-cloud and multi-tenant. So what that means to you is that if you have a team in Europe and you use a lot of AWS, we have a place for you in Frankfurt in the AWS data center where your data can be housed. If you happen to be in the UK and you wanna keep your data in the UK, maybe you use Azure, we have a region in London on Azure for that. So we run across AWS and Azure, multi-region uh, in those, so you can pick where your data is stored. Uh, we provide amazing customer success, customer service. You can see that uh, from our reviews, you can talk to our customers, we're happy to introduce you to. And we also give you a named uh, security analyst and customer success manager. This means that if you have a new piece of security gear, you're seeing a new type of threat, or you just want simple things done for you, like setting up a dashboard, helping me add these users, integrate with the SSO system that we use, we're there to help you. We're always uh, a very quick click away in the product. And uh, we provide that unlimited scalability. It helps your team scale to have the expertise at logs.io, but it also helps that we run in this cloud native format where we can expand your infrastructure as needed. And then of course we have your typical um, certifications. Uh, I'm not gonna go through them while there. Uh, and we always have plans of new audits, new certifications. We're working on a couple of new things over the next year. And then some of the unique features that we have is our ability to take your SIM uh, that you've deployed and divide it into little accounts that each team can manage separately. So this gives you centralized control as the security team, and you can allocate quota and manage different sort of slices of your data and apply role-based access control. 
Um, the other thing that's really concerning to people is they want to keep data for a long time. And a lot of times they have different criteria. Some people say we need to keep seven years of data. Other people say we need 90 days. Some people want it for more short-term analysis. We have lots of different ways to save you money by moving your data to cheaper ways of storing and analyzing and indexing it. So we can typically find the right mix between the different types of storage to save you money and, and meet your compliance requirements. Um, so there's lots of capabilities in the product around that, and we're always building more. So like I said, we, you know, not only do we build this platform, but we give you the content that you need. Our analysts are always building content. If you come to us and say, I need content for this type of device, that then goes into the library that everyone at logs.io, all our customers can use. The content includes alerting, it includes dashboarding, parsing, uh, gives you all of the pieces. So we're always adding more. We have hundreds of types of integrations and content and out of the box alerting. I picked a few common suspects here, things that most of you are probably using. Some of the open source, we partner with a few of these companies. We support the open source projects as well. So if you happen to be using Wazoo, we have a, a really nice integration with them. Uh, it gives you a lot of great endpoint detection data, zero cost if you're using the open source, uh, and lots of other uh, ways that you can solve some of these problems. And then finally, if you're using the cloud, which most of you likely are, you probably have new data types coming from your cloud providers, coming from cloud native infrastructure. And we built a lot of really nice integrations to take this data in, provide you with great dashboards, alerts, out of the box views. Uh, the other big thing that we deliver is uh, threat intelligence. And what we do is we take a bunch of both open source threat feeds and proprietary commercial threat feeds. We bring that all together. We correlate the log data with the threat feeds so that you can understand the threat profile in your organization. You can bring your own feed so it's easy to add your own private feed. If maybe you're purchasing a feed from CrowdStrike or you're using something from FireEye, it's, it's easy to bring in your own feeds and your own data. We even have customers that have government data feeds, so those are easy to add into. Uh, there's no limit on this, you can, you can add whatever feeds you would like. Uh, one of the other big features of SIM is incident management. Uh, we have several options today. Uh, many of our customers use ServiceNow as an example for managing their incidents. We have an integration. We're building a lot of new stuff with ServiceNow as well. Uh, but we can integrate with any system out there. We support a lot out of the box, whether you're using something more operational like PagerDuty. We use OpsGenie internally, uh, but we allow you to integrate very easily with, with pretty robust APIs on that side. Uh, more and more of our customers are investing in looking at SOAR. So today we have integrations with Palo Alto Cortex, that's the Domisto product line and Simplify, but we also have APIs for these. So you can actually integrate it into any closed loop uh, SOAR type setup. And then finally we're, and, and you'll hear about this a little bit from our product manager, we're building a, a pretty simple case management system in the product. Uh, but we can integrate with anything. We've got uh, customers using the Hive and various other open source incident management systems. So uh, you, can, you can bring your own, you can use the built-in stuff that we're uh, currently building out. So lots of options to fit your workflow and that's uh, how we like to keep it. Uh, so we specifically focus on machine learning in a different way. We look at machine learning as a way to augment the performance of your team. How do I speed up the engineering capability to identify and resolve issues? So we look for things that are uh, contributors to problems, or we look at the workflows that your team is doing in the tool, and we try to optimize those. And that's really what we do in general. Uh, we've got a lot of capabilities that surface interesting data within the logs automatically. 
We correlate that with public discussions. So we do a lot of interesting things that are pretty unique in the market. We don't do the typical anomaly detection, although we are building that. Uh, we tend to find that that's very noisy, creates a lot of false positives, and is generally not well accepted by users. They end up buying the vision, and the reality is very noisy. So, um, you know, we're, we're trying to make uh, anomaly detection better, but it's a, it's a long-standing problem in the industry, and I don't think it's, uh, it's easily solvable. So we take a different approach to it. So what I mentioned is this cognitive insights uh, technology that we built a couple of years ago is still very useful. And what we do is we surface interesting sets of data within the log. Uh, we then surface that, and you can see over here on the right, we link directly to discussions about this particular problem. These are security problems, they're operational problems, they could indicate a compromise. Uh, and we bring that forward, allow you to do the research. So, how do we think ahead of the team uh, and, and really surface the right information? That's our approach to the problem. And that was all that I prepared. We've got a lot of exciting stuff coming. Uh, you'll hear a lot about the roadmap, the vision, the direction of the product um, from some of the other folks on the team. And I just wanted to thank you for uh, spending the time today hearing what we have to say and I look forward to working with you and helping guide the vision of where we're going here with the cloud sim. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonah. Uh, just a, a quick comment. Jonah talked about smart tiering for uh, you know sort of cost savings, but little known fact in the cloud sim world where longer retention periods are common, you know, like 90 day retention, the smart tiering also allows us to kind of keep all the data pretty much hot and the query performance really, really fast over longer retention, just because of the way we architected it, which is, is very cool. You save time and money at the same time. So first giveaway of the day, in Jonah's session, what challenge does he say logs.io hears about Sims time and time again? First person to answer correctly in the chat wins. Okay, so our second session today is brought to you by Oded Venunu, Head of Products Vulnerability Research at Checkpoint Software. Oded is going to dive into underground roles and structures of cybercrime syndicates, how they operate, uh, and then review some major cybercrime incidents and look at how those underground roles took part in the incidents themselves. Hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me to the session, The Upside Down. The goal of this session is to make sure to deliver the data of the research that I did uh, two years ago about mapping the entire cybercrime underground roles and responsibilities. We will understand how cyber attacks are so bulletproof, how cyber attacks are so sophisticated, and there are no too many takedowns of cybercrime activities. We will understand how cybercrime become so um, and so so good in their delivering of their uh, um, cyber or malicious activity. So first of all, first of all, about myself. So I'm 20 years on the uh, cyberspace, focusing on offensive security, mainly on vulnerability research and threat intelligence. And uh, my fundamental is software architecture, and uh, this is where I coming from. Um, okay, so let's start and understand how cybercrime become powerful as a nation. So it all began a few years ago when the cryptocurrency became a big thing. Then cyber criminals understood that if they will issue cyber attacks, they can cash out in a very easy way. And if they will be able to cash out, it means that they can start build organizations that have budgets and have revenue. And of course, if this organization is dealing with cybercrime, so they will focusing on uh, getting as many as cyber weapons they could get in order that they can attack and take out data information because data today is worth a lot of money. So this is why cybercrime uh, with, with the years that uh, passed uh, with the cryptocurrency and everything become very structured organized with CEO, CTO, uh, operation managers, 
etc. And uh, uh, we need to understand that uh, following the mapping that I did, so basically we saw that, as I said, that it has like a CEO, CTO, operation manager, they have customers and they have CFO to take the entire uh, money from their uh, execution. So before we will start explaining each uh, uh, roles and what they are doing, so first of all, let's understand how the cybercrime are communicating today. What are their channels to communicate with their target or also between themselves? So they are using our application, any end-to-end, -end, any real end-to-end -end encryption uh, application, uh, cybercrime will use. And of course, from what we are uh, seeing, uh, what we terminated, they are using mainly uh, Telegram and uh, uh, Skype and also Java, but there are many uh, uh, applications like Signal that are using end-to-end uh, -end encryption and they are all using it. So let's start and understand what are the roles and responsibilities. So first we have the Kingpin. Kingpin, is Pablo Escobar of the cybercrime. There are many uh, uh, um, people that moved from traditional crime into cybercrime. These people have um, a, a lot of power, a lot of connection, and usually they have uh, access to, to money that they can uh, use. And these are the people that define the, uh, the target goals or the revenue goals. And once they are uh, uh, defining the revenue goal, meaning that they want to do some kind of campaign or, or actually they are doing the negotiation or they are doing the, the, um, the negotiation with other parties to collect a target. Or for example, there are the people that are uh, understanding if we will be able to attack some kind of a, a, a big asset, we will get a lot of money. So they are making sure to create the target and the objective. And the kingpin as a CTO. And the CTO has a lot of services that he is managing and people that he is managing. And usually he is working with malware authors, with phishing kit uh, developers, and hacking tools developers, because the technical manager responsibility is to create a cyber weapon. The, the CEO or the kingpin define the target, and, and the technical manager is doing all the aspects of making sure that there will be correct weapon to uh, infect the target. And some of the services that he is using is using exploiters to make sure to take one day's vulnerabilities and to tweak them or to adjust them that we will be able to use. In addition, they are using services of uh, fully undetected or uh, packing services to make sure that all the weapons that they are doing, the one-day weapons, will not be detected. So they're actually running it on a sandbox environment with all the security vendor, vendors agents, engines to ensure that their weapon is not detected. And of course, they are running it on the sandbox because if they will run it uh, on the wild, it will be automatically uh, uh, detected and will be sent to virus total and it will be uh, uh, signed everywhere. So this is that the responsibilities of uh, the technical manager. And uh, these are like examples of uh, weapons that uh, technical managers are buying from uh, service providers to uh, adjust them to their uh, attack or to their uh, mission. And these are services that uh, uh, the technical manager is using to make sure that his weapons will not be detected. These are services to make sure that, uh, to run a lot of security vendors against their weapons to ensure it will not be uh, detected. The next role that we have is the operation manager. The operation manager has a very critical um, responsibility, is getting the weapon from the CTO. But as we know today, cyber attacks are very sophisticated, cyber attacks can uh, take for uh, take long for take few days long, and and cyber attacks are so diverse and they are changing all the time, and, and we know that for example a malicious DNS can live up to four hours, and this means that the operation manager is responsible for all the bullet all the bulletproof hosting, making sure that all the infrastructure, making sure that all the infection points, making sure that 
all the tools uh, uh, will never be uh, down and the entire, uh, uh, what we call a DevOps uh, uh, operation will be managed by the operation manager. And for example, the operation managers as a spammers. And what are these spammers? So these are services that making sure uh, uh, um, that are making sure that uh, every mail that you will send will be uh, uh, accessed to the inbox. Even today in 2021, we are still getting uh, a spam into our inbox. And we know that spam is 80% of the uh, cyber attacks uh, today because a lot of people uh, click it. So how they do it? So the spammers are a bunch of very sophisticated person that did reverse engineering to any mail server in the world, and they know how to bypass. They know how to make sure that your emails that they will send <clears throat> will, will make to the target. And once the target will click the link that the operation manager hosted and the CTO provided the weapon that once will be clicked, will be downloaded to the user. And then they are infected. There are also traffic sellers and traffic sellers are very uh, uh, interesting. The, the traffic seller is making sure that uh, if, for example, you can buy traffic that will, uh, re that will be redirected <clears throat> to your uh, uh, malicious uh, 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 infection point. Meaning that uh, um, uh, hackers or uh, cybercrime attacking very legitimate websites that has millions of uh, users accessing every day and they are just planting a very small JavaScript on this uh, website without doing too much. And every time that, ever, that you access to these websites, and these are very legitimate uh, websites, the JavaScript is being uh, downloaded to your browser and the browser is sending a GET request to the malicious site and then you get infected behind the scene. So the traffic seller making sure to send you diversity, traffic from Asia, traffic from the Middle East, traffic from Europe, traffic from America, from specific people, from specific countries. It's very, very diverse. And the hosters are making sure that the infrastructure will not take down. This is example of hosters location in uh, Europe that was actually taken down by uh, uh, the European. And we see how they are like offering, what they are offering uh, uh, from a bulletproof uh, perspective. And here we can see how much it takes to, uh, to send spam. For, so for example, you can get a service of 2,500 uh, 2, uh, emails uh, uh, per day for uh, uh, only $30. And also we can see here that you can get traffic that will be that will be directed to your malicious point. And here, for example, you can get 1,000 users for $70. And it's it has a lot of diversity around it. So we know the kingpin that uh, create the objective and define the target. And we know the technical manager that is responsible for all the weapons. And we know that operation manager is the one that taking the weapon and making sure that everything will be bulletproof and not be and will not be detected and will make sure to escalate the attack with spammers, with traffic sellers and, and hosters. And our next is our customers or, and the victims. So once the victims are being infected and, and all the data is being, uh, sorry, once the victims are being uh, targeted, there is a lot <clears throat> of information that now worth a lot of money. So for example, I have a target and I access this target and the target has a malware. So now I can access to his Gmail, to his bank accounts, to his WhatsApp, uh, to his uh, Telegram, to his uh, uh, code repository, everything has a tag price. So once there is a victim that is being uh, uh, targeted, so what we call, we have data analysts that starting to map what data they can get from this user and how much money they can get. Second, once they're uh, for a target attacks that are, uh, 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 that are um, making sure that target attacks that are stealing money, so, all the money is being sent to uh, cryptocurrency wallets. And, and these wallets are uh, being cashed out. So uh, cybercrime are using mules to deliver 
the money they are uh, acquiring or they are like making sure to uh, suggest or to offer uh, for Mueller's uh, a very good uh, um, challenges or very good. Uh, um, um, So the mules are responsible to deliver uh, the money from uh, uh, the targets to uh, the users. And there are exchange bit mixing services to make sure that the wallets of the cybercrime will not be detected at any time, meaning that once there is attack and the user need to send money to the wallet to, to get key for example or to or to get some kind of uh, uh, release from uh, uh, from his attack so the wallets that he will get for sending the money is usually mixed uh, wallets to make sure to uh, that law enforcement will not be able to track wallets and to understand the size of the attack how much money they got from the attack so these are services making sure that uh, uh, that all the money transfer will be transfer uh, will be transparent and uh, the law enforcement cannot understand what's going on there behind the scene so this is like an example for a, a, a mulling uh, services that they are looking for people that will buy and uh, will shop on stores they will get a bunch of money and of course for example they can get $100, $20 they put in their pocket and they need to buy something at $80 and deliver to the cybercrime. So there is a big market around it of uh, um, use and etc. Another example is the a Bitcoin blender, which takes the wallets and, and mix them so that you cannot track them. So we talked about the kingpin, we talk about the CTO, the operation manager, the target, and the CFO, of course, that uh, uh, collects the data and making sure how much the data worth. And then once all the information is being delivered to the kingpin, then he can understand uh, if he wants to take the data that they achieved, and to create more operation or to deliver it to the operation manager that will sell, start sell the data to brokers. And we have a lot of brokers in the underground that are buying uh, uh, personal information leaks and buying like, for example, every personal uh, data. And this is how it looks like. You can uh, today uh, order a credit card that that is being stilled and uh, for example you can get here a visa card that has between two uh, two thousand five hundred to five thousand dollar you can get it only from uh, for one hundred one uh, one hundred ten dollars and this is like uh, um, uh, also an example of mastercards with up to four thousand five hundred euro on $130. And this is how it works. It's, 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 it's very interesting and, 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 and we need to understand that the, really in the underground, the facilities and the execution is, is working smoothly. And of course, <clears throat> we don't have time to talk about it, but we know about state sponsors that are using cybercrime and services to execute attacks on other state sponsor or, or on their targets. So it's a very big research and, and to take it for, a, a, for 20 minutes, it's very challenging, a, but I just wanted to deliver you the concept of a, the cybercrime activities a, and, and what's really going here in the underground. So we need to, to understand today cybercrime are professionals. They have very solid services. They really, really have sophistication in their activity and they really, really understand technology. They exactly know what are the weak points, what are the vulnerabilities, and they have researchers to uh, supply the demand of their kingpin. And today, 
the, the darknet or the underground is quietly accessible for uh, easily because all the cryptocurrency uh, make it uh, uh, very or give incentive for the cyber crime to create or to show their services in a very uh, easy way uh, because every communication or everything that they are uh, uh, offering and sending everything is of course in, on encrypted uh, uh, technologies and all the money transfer is done uh, by cryptocurrency uh, and this is why we see more hackers and more attacks uh, and and we uh, for example are spending our daily uh, base uh, work on fighting back these uh, cyber crime activities and uh, and we have a very big operation that is dealing with the um, cyber takedowns um, and this is another story that we uh, can talk uh, uh, on other meeting so to sum it up cyber crime a very sophisticated cyber crime our organizations and we will continue to see very big cyber crime activities uh, unfortunately but this is currently uh, the reality and it's good to deliver uh, you this information um, thank you very much for your time Thanks very much, Oded. That was really, really interesting. Uh, learning about the discipline with which these gangs operate, and you know, especially to me, the money laundering aspect of kind of mixing Bitcoin wallets is pretty fascinating. I'd never heard of that before. So our next session is from Milind Adari. He goes by Mill. He's an information security engineer at the Associated Press. I sat down with Mill, asked him about how his small team rapidly adopted Logs.io Cloud Sim in 2020, which was a really critical year for news organizations. Also had a chance to ask him about his workflows, his data ingestion pipeline, a lot of really kind of nuts and bolts stuff. After my conversation with Mill, we'll see a short demo from Ashley Somerville. She's a senior customer success engineer at logs.io, who is going to showcase some of the features uh, that you hear about in my conversation with Mill. So here you go, hope you enjoy. Well, hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I wanted to start off just by learning a little bit about how you got into security. Like kind of everybody has their own path into the field. So, so what was yours? Yeah, no, great question. So I initially started out in technology at a very, very young age and quickly became a passion for me. And with technology, there's just so many different fields. And one of my favorite things growing up was puzzles. And I find security to be like one of the biggest puzzles there is. So naturally, I kind of gravitated towards security as a, like the field I wanted to specialize in. And that's where I am now. Right on. And, and so how long have you been with AP specifically? A little over two years now. Yeah. And it's, it's been an amazing journey here. Um, the people here are all so mission oriented and so wonderful to work with. There's a real sense of like accomplishment that comes from working here that I've honestly never had before. Yeah, I, so I, I actually spent some time at Thomson Reuters. So I, I understand that feeling, you know, and, and these are companies that go back, you know, 150 plus years. Uh, so the real sense of tradition too, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, obviously the Associated Press is a household name in the US and syndicates internationally, journalists all over the world. Um, anything you can share about kind of just the scale of, of AP? Yeah, like you mentioned Reuters, um, we're one of the largest and oldest news organizations in the world. <clears throat> so we do news on a global front. So we're everywhere on the front lines of the largest stories in the world, uh, gathering content, videos, and photography. And we're probably the most trusted source of unbiased journalism in the world. So it's a pretty neat thing. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Um, in terms of your team, I want to get into the responsibilities that you cover. Uh, you know, information security teams can be structured in different ways. You know, are you purely focused on security operations? Does your team cover, you know, things like forensics or threat hunting? <laughs> so it's honestly all of the above. Uh, unfortunately, I wouldn't say we have the luxury of being specialized in one little facet of security. Uh, so we're focused on everything from infrastructure to cloud to application security, and then all the in-betweens in-between as well. 
and and also covering uh, sort of the security architecture, I'm guessing, in terms of managing workflow, managing toolkit, managing policy. You do that as well? Yep. Yeah. So, so a team of generalists then, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No specialists, all generalists for sure. Very good. Uh, you know, when we're talking about IT ops or security ops, it's all kind of computer stuff at the end of the day, right? <laughs> you know, if you if you uh, if you specialize, that's great and everything. Some people got to be T shaped, but uh, you know, as a generalist myself, I I appreciate that posture. Um, so you know, every security team has a set of challenges that are really common across businesses. You know, this is the common stuff like making sure you got your firewalls properly configured, you know, trying to get your asset inventory under control. Like everybody has that stuff. Uh, what are the specific challenges to AP and kind of the journalism business that you might not see in, you know, a, a hospital or some other, other kind of organization? Yeah, absolutely. So being a global organization it involves us having journalists all over the world. And our attack surface is in turn massive. We're not really restricted to like one siloed location where we operate out of. So we have also being a very old organization, we have a lot of legacy hardware, just inventory everywhere all over the world. So it's kind of accounting for every single employee, every single device that connects back to our corporate network. So in turn, we have so many devices that are kind of exposed to the internet and in turn our tax service is just massive. So one of the challenges here has been we need visibility into everything. And that's kind of where the need for a SIM came into place. Gotcha. Yeah. So talking the, about the journalists, um, are they using their own devices? I mean, do you issue them special equipment? How does that work when they're out in the field, especially when they're in, you know, sort of um, sensitive or even dangerous uh, locations in the globe? Yeah. So for the most part, we, we have devices that we allocate to journalists. And there's also journalists that want to use their own devices. So if they're in a sensitive location, uh, like China or Russia, we, we do have like security in place to make sure uh, their devices aren't being tampered with or if their device is ever confiscated, we have security measures in place to kind of just wipe the device. Yeah, so I mean, do you have special focus when it comes to monitoring events in a SIM, do you have special focus on those journalist devices or do you kind of treat everything as, as equal across the organization? Yeah, um, a little bit of both. So I, ideally, like we do have a special concentrated number of like high profile journalists that we want to keep a closer look or closer eye on. And for the most part, we, we have rules in place that kind of alert us if there's any suspicious, uh, suspicious behavior on those journalists. But for the most part, yeah, the same rules apply to everyone in the organization. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. So uh, I think before you adopted the Logs.io cloud sim, you were running your own Elasticsearch. Is that right? Yeah, we explored a few sim vendors and eventually kind of landed on Elastic because Elastic was being used internally. Uh, one of the challenges we kind of faced with that was how do we piggyback on already an, an existing Elastic infrastructure? And I think that's kind of where we faced a lot of our initial uh, barriers and we migrated to wanting to have a managed uh, SIM provider. And, and was that, you know, due to just kind of the complexity of managing it yourself? Like what was the, what was the challenge there? Yeah, I think it's a complexity um, trying to kind of piggyback on an already existing solution. Like how do we allocate uh, a specific sub account or um, how do we start indexing our own data and not interfere with data that's already coming in from other sources. Yeah, I mean that that's the um, that's in a category of things that is like the the point of logs.io, you know, as a as an elastic vendor or a cloud sim vendor is like figuring out those challenges and doing them at scale and it ends up just being cheaper and easier to have some other company worry about the little the little minuscule kind of headaches. Um so that makes sense and I was hoping you could say a few words, you know, you you, you sort of approach uh, our company, you start working with us you know, what was that experience like, uh, the good and the bad? You know, what worked well in, in getting up and running? And, you know, quite honestly, what could we do better? Honestly, from the get-go, it was, it was a great experience. I remember even during the POC, um, you guys were very hands-on. Uh, we came in with a clear-cut picture of what we envisioned for our SIM implementation. And we got feedback along the way to kind of adjust. Like, we're not married to an idea coming in. So taking your perspective of what you've already implemented out there, 
really helped us shape what we envisioned with our sim. And you guys were there every step of the way. Um, we bounced off a lot of ideas that we had. And it overall, it was a great experience. I honestly don't really have any negative feedback. <laughs> okay. Clear. And and for everyone watching, I didn't prompt Mill to say <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, but very glad to hear it. You know, we take pride in our, you know, especially our, our customer success teams and our operations and support teams. Uh, actually, you know, we're going to be hearing from Ashley Somerville, customer success engineer, who's going to demo some of the, the features we're talking about here today. So good to hear. Um, I want to hear a little bit about how you've or, you know, kind of architected your data ingestion pipeline? You know, how, do, how does everything get from point A, which is, you know, maybe the endpoints or the app firewalls or whatever, you know, through to the raw data of, of the logs and then ultimately into the SIM? Yeah, so it, it varies on the ingestion source. Um, so one of the first steps that we had laid out when we first started working with you guys is we had about a dozen sources that we wanted to ingest in our SIM to kind of give us that visibility into our infrastructure. And we quickly kind of filtered out sources that we realized didn't really give us as much visibility as we thought it would. So from there, it was identifying which source needed a specific pipeline built. But for the most part, you guys already had majority of those integrations in place. So with your ingestion documentation was great. We just kind of followed along. And if we needed help, we got help from uh, your engineers. Excellent. Yeah. So one of the, you know, the sort of ongoing optimizations you want to do, yeah, maybe I'll put it a different way, something you want to do up front and then optimize along the way is you want to remove any noise from the logs so that A, you have a better experience of what you're looking at, you know, signal to noise ratio, then B, you're not paying for, for extraneous data. So I guess, which data sources did you find as, as not so valuable? Hmm. So... One of the logs that we initially wanted to ingest was we have a lot of legacy hardware. So we wanted some sort of visibility into the legacy hardware. So we were initially thinking about just ingesting system logs um, from our legacy hardware, but we quickly realized there's not really too much valuable telemetry that comes from there, especially when we're kind of like responding to an incident. So we kind of transitioned away from just specifically system logs. And we looked at deploying some endpoint agents like Wazoo on these devices that would give us a little bit more valuable information than just generic system logs. Mm -hmm. Great, and yeah. I, so that, that's, that's a really interesting approach that you're taking a, you know, sort of relatively new open source endpoint agent and deploying to legacy hardware. You know, were there any kind of integration challenges there or was it pretty straightforward? No, um, it was pretty straightforward. We, we got the agents deployed you guys already had an ingestion pipeline built for Wazoo, so it was pretty easy to set up from that end. And one of the biggest benefits of using you guys is the ability that you guys have to parse, and we don't have to do that. So that saves us a whole lot of time. Um, having engineers that we can like just reach out to, say, like, can you drop this field? Can you get rid of this? Can you uh, parse out this value so it's like easily searchable? I, I can't tell you, especially like going through the process of setting up Elastic for the first time, that was probably one of the most painstaking things to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we kind of take the view that the product is the service is the product kind of thing, you know, that kind of true cloud native approach. Um, so I'm glad to hear that you benefited from that. And yeah, parsing is another one of those things that's just really annoying to do. And we figured out that, you know, either we've already done it or we've gotten really good at it. So totally. Um, I guess now that that ingestion pipeline is, you know, pretty well tuned, uh, what does your incident response workflow look like? How does it get from, you know, an event through to investigation and resolution? Sure, so after we had all our sources ingested, uh, we worked with a couple of your guys' engineers, uh, security engineers to kind of start building out alerts. So now that we had a bunch of different log sources coming in, it's how do we identify what is an incident that we need to respond to? So we started creating alerts within Logs.io that kind of work in turn with, we, we use Defender ATP. So if an alert triggers off Defender ATP, we can kind of look in Logs.io to see if that alert pops up with one of the generic alerts that we've created or alerts that your security engineer has created. So if both those alerts coincide, we can start investigating within Logs.io because ideally we've wanted Logs.io to be our single pane of class for incident response. So if an incident happens, it's kind of our first step to start looking at logs 
and trying to pinpoint exactly the time, uh, what sources were affected and from there investigate. Right. So you mentioned Defender ATP. What information are you getting uh, from that platform specifically? Sure. So we're, we're kind of a Microsoft shop. So Defender ATP kind of gives us a lot of telemetry, uh, telemetry into where our employees are, what our, our devices are, the status of our devices, uh, authentication requests. Um, it's also integrated with Microsoft security product, Defender. So they kind of come in with a bunch of threat intelligence on what's malicious, what's not malicious. So from there, we kind of get alerted on suspicious behavior. Once that be like suspicious behavior alert comes in, we can start looking at logs from other sources that we're ingesting to see if there's a pattern or these two particular log events correlate. Gotcha. Right on. Um, so you're using sort of threat intel data from Microsoft. Are you using any of the logs IO threat intel? Are they complementary? Do they, is there anything that you've had to sort of disable on one side or the other because they overlap? No. So I, I think even if they overlap, they overlap well, if that makes sense. Uh, they, yeah, they, they don't really like prevent each other from alerting us of a, a suspicious behavior. So for example, you guys have a malicious IP list. Defender ATP also has a malicious IP list. So if there's an alert that triggers from Defender ATP, we see that same alert in logs. So it's kind of reinforcing the fact that alerting from both ends is working the way it's supposed to. Okay, good. Yeah, one of the things that we see with a, a number of our customers who are using multiple uh, threat intel sources, you know, some of which aren't even necessarily like blessed thread intel, but more just lists of usernames and stuff like that, uh, is they use the lookup tables feature in the cloud sim. Is that something you're, you're using with thread intel or no? Yeah, yeah, uh, the lookup tables is a great feature. So we started going back to these um, high profile journalists, like we started creating lookup tables to kind of um, identify sensitive sources, um, workstations that we need to monitor or identified suspicious like malware, uh, malware signatures. So we started creating and curating these lookup tables to kind of aggregate across all our logs that are re-ingesting and create alerts to go off these lookup tables if need be. Excellent, excellent. Um, so, you know, you've, you've been with AP for two years. You've now, you know, sort of adopted a, a SIM platform in conjunction with a number of other platforms. You're pulling stuff together. It seems pretty well integrated. I guess, you know, my last question to you is when you look across the next 12 to 24 months, you know, security is a journey. You're never done, right? So what are you looking for? What's your vision for, for what comes next at AP? Yeah, so I think the ultimate goal with security is always automation. Um, so right now we've started finally like getting to a point where we have near visibility into our entire infrastructure, like we initially envisioned. So once we completely flush that, out and we have total visibility, I think our next step is really um, sort. And we, we really want that automation aspect with our SIM because between me and the other guys working in security, we don't have necessarily time to look at every specific alert or every incident that pops up. We want to start writing playbooks. We want to just be able to be like, okay, this alert came up. Let's automate a response and just call it a day. Right. Nobody has enough time or people, especially in security, you know, where, where talent is so hard to come by. So definitely appreciate that. And, you know, we'll obviously be happy to, to support you in that journey as you select a platform, get integrated, all that good stuff. Well, Mel, thanks so much for joining me. I, I really enjoyed talking with you and learning more about the way that you run your security practice. Uh, as I mentioned, Ashley is going to demo some of these features. So, you, you know, get a sense of really tangibly how this looks. But once again, Mel, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Eric. Cheers. Bye. Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Somerville. I'm the customer success engineer for Associated Press. Um, today I'll be walking us through a demonstration of the Logs.io Cloud Sim, particularly focusing on the features and functionality that Mill's team uses today and has integrated into their workflow. Um, we'll also be focusing on how Logs.io can be used to identify and investigate malicious activity occurring in your own cloud environment. Let's get started. We'll start here in Slack where we've gotten an alert showing us that multiple EC2 instances have been started by the same user. Included in the payload to this endpoint, you can see that there's a playbook with suggested next steps. 
This can be really valuable if the receiver of this alert is not familiar with your incident response. By clicking View in Kibana, we can continue to investigate what's going on around this alert. This will bring us into Logs.io into the Discover tab. With the correct filter applied, that triggered this alert. You'll see one of the filters is a lookup for the username that is associated with this alert. And we've limited this to just usernames included in the lookup called contracted employees. Let's take a look at what this lookup looks like. Moving into the lookup section of the app, we can open the contracted employees and see the different values that are included in this lookup list. I've also added notes which designate the start dates of these particular employees. By applying the filter to just include these particular values, I'm only being alerted of those users who are spinning up EC2 instances in my contracted employees list. I also have a separate alert which shows that negates this filter and shows me all of the alerts that are triggered for non-contracted employees. This helps me analyze the two events separately. Scrolling down, we can see that the instance ID is a hyperlink, which will allow us to drill down further into the activity that went around this particular instance ID. Clicking here, this will open up the dashboard designed for monitoring EC2 machines for malicious activities. You'll see that the filter carries over with the particular instance ID, and we have various information here to help us investigate. We can see in the EC2 started instances list that Dana is starting the most instances across multiple regions, and there all, are also successful SSH connections occurring to these EC2s. From here, we still need to investigate further, so we can click on Dana's username, which will bring us again into another dashboard that will help us investigate this issue. By drilling into this dashboard, we can see a summary of the various alerts that have been triggered in the cloud sim that are associated with this particular user. So you can see Dana has also been flagged by various open source technologies, Zeek, Saracata, et cetera, for port scanning activity and browsing to phishing URLs. We can see the different sites that Dana has visited, which is helpful, but more helpful is looking at the sites that are associated with malicious addresses. This is accomplished via our threat intelligence. We have various threat intelligence feeds that we're using to compare against um, external IPs, DNS, URL, and many others that you're sending in your logs to us. Once we've identified an IOC, we'll populate it for you to take a closer look. In this case, you can see one of the sites that Dana is navigating to with these EC2s is flagged as mining related. After seeing that this user has browsed to cryptocurrency mining URLs, we can conclude that um, these EC2 machines are being spun up related to a malware attack and take action. This was just one of the many ways that the advanced security analytics tools Logs.io's Cloud Sim provides can help teams like Moon secure their environment. Now we're going to take a look at an example. If you didn't get an active alert, but you still were in the system trying to figure out and investigate a security issue that's occurring. By jumping back to our summary dashboard, we can see all of the malicious activity that has occurred over the last 24 hours across our whole environment. We can see the summary of events here, which includes that alert that we got to our Slack channel earlier in the demonstration. We can sort the severity to see things that are more severe and see not only this example from earlier, but also that there are brute force SSH login attempts occurring in our environment at this time. We can filter for this particular event and again click to investigate further. This will similarly bring us into Kibana with the correct filter applied where we can continue our investigation. Expanding a document, we can see that this is an SSH event and drill down into the dashboard particularly related to SSH events. This brings us to the SSH login attempts dashboard where we can see the count of SSH logins over time. Clearly there was a big spike in failures, which is suspicious. We can see the top IPs that have attempted to log in. 
where this traffic is coming from in the world and their particular users. Clearly, we don't want SSH login attempts happening from the root user, so we can continue to drill down here, filtering in just for root. We can see the source IP, where this traffic is coming from. Perhaps we have um, no offices and no users from this location, so this is already very suspicious. We can see that a few of these IPs have been flagged by our threat intelligence, and here's the feed in particular that they've been flagged by. From here, we can block these IPs on our firewall and continue to investigate to make sure that no, um, there was nothing compromised in this infiltration. That's an overview of our CloudSim platform. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Well, thank you, Mill. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, I loved learning more from Mill about the specifics of his workflow as he's protecting the security posture of AP's journalists. Really important work there. Final giveaway of the day. What prompted AP to make the switch to logs.io cloud sim from running their own Elasticsearch? Answer in the chat. Our final session for today, and the one I know a lot of you have been waiting for, I had a chance to sit down with Smadar Paradise. She's the director of product management at logs.io. We're going to take a transparent look at the technology roadmap for logs.io cloud sim, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. <laughs> So I'm here with Smadar Paradise, who is Director of Product Management at Logs.io. Uh, Smadar, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. How are you? Doing very well. Thanks. Uh, so Smadar is going to walk us through the vision for the Cloud Sim product and the roadmap. Uh, just let's, let's go ahead and get started. So in, in 2020, we had a lot of great success with the Cloud Sim in terms of uh, you know, new customers, new business, but most importantly, you know, new functionality, new feature set in the product. So Smidar, maybe you can talk us through these highlights from 2020. Sure, I'll be happy to. So uh, 2020 was a very challenging year for all of us. We know that. But it was also a very interesting year for the teams, the security teams at Logs.io. And uh, what we saw is the adoption of the product by larger companies and MSSPs, in addition to our uh, regular uh, customers. And uh, these uh, larger customers, they usually have many different security teams and also they need to onboard different customers. So we had to uh, open the option to have multiple security accounts. And now customers can uh, use the different accounts to segregate between customers. In addition, we added the amazing feature of the correlated rules. So, for example, if you have a um, brute force attempt uh, do, uh, done by a malicious IP, that's a legit rule, makes sense. But if on top of it, the destination host also downloaded a, mal a malware, now, the combination of the two events is much more interesting and lets us uh, build a correlated rule combining those two events into a stronger rule, uh, prevent uh, false positives, and uh, use much more use cases in the product. And of course, the threat intelligence, which is so uh, popular. So yes, we do have 15 out-of-the-box feeds some are commercial, some are private uh, paid feeds, but customers have their own feeds. For example, when they have uh, security researchers that are coming up with IOCs of their own and they want to use it for their, for their environment only. In this case, we added the private feeds and now customers can have one or more of their own feeds, use it only on their rule and get much more from our threat intelligence, correlating those IOCs in their logs. And APIs, it goes without saying, automation is so important. And so last year we added so many APIs so customers can automate their uh, security um, work, workloads. So yeah, it should go without saying in 2020 or 2021 that automation is key. 
but this is a place where we're a little different uh, because we have you know, truly an API first development process and mindset. Um, where we develop the API first and then you know UI on top of it, uh, which is part of our our cloud native philosophy. Um, you know, and, and in 2020 and 2021, we really developed a vision of of what the product should be, uh, and it is cloud native, it's fully managed, and it's cost effective. Uh, cost effective in terms of price point, but also just in terms of how we help smaller security teams scale you know, their ability to cover the entire attack surface and even larger security teams. And we all know that there's a skill set shortage and a, and a 0% unemployment rate in InfoSec today. Uh, and that's what we're, we're trying to solve. And, and we solve that, you know, by just being a fully managed service, but also, you know, that automation aspect uh, and higher quality detections from correlated rules, you know, our, our whole aim here is to become the preferred tool for security analysts by making the workflow more effective and making the technology really serve the needs of the, of the user. So that's the vision. And we're going to talk about the specifics of how we implement that vision in 2021. Uh, but first, Smidar, you want to give us our, our standard disclaimer here about uh, what we're going to see. We're going to be really transparent with the roadmap, um, but we want to give a caution about, you know, what, what the information that you see here today uh, could end up looking like when all is said and done. Exactly. So to set uh, expectations, I'd like just to read our disclaimer that our cloud seed roadmap is being shared for informational purposes only. However, the development release and timing of this roadmap is subject to change. Thank you, Eric. Yep, absolutely. Just got to get it out there. So, you know, we talked about the vision uh, in terms of the vision of just making this the go to you know, one-stop shop for security analysts for detection and investigation. You know, it starts with detection, you know, detecting events. So, uh, Smanar, in 2021, what are we building to enhance our detection capability? Yes, in 2021, well, let's start with the detection rule. So, it, this is one of the most powerful capabilities that we have. And that's because the, the product comes with over 400 out-of-the-box Rules. So once you start using the product, within minutes, you start getting real events from your logs in your environment. And that works really, really well and customers love it. So we are adding on top of it, the use of dynamic blacklist, whitelist in the rules. Meaning, let's say you have the 400 out of the box rules and then you added your own custom rules for your environment and you're really happy, everything works fine. You don't want to get back and tweak it all the time and configure it. You can maintain outside of the rules, dynamic uh, list, for example, with assets, let's say your uh, usernames or hosts or server IPs or even IOCs. And when something happened, let's say a real live attack, like we've seen the RIOC attacks on hospitals and healthcare last year, you can just uh, maintain this list, uh, download new IOCs, change them, and so on. So for this capability, we're adding some uh, features like reading these lists from CSV and adding TTLs, time to leave, threshold, for each one of the records in this list. In this case, it can be an IOC and um, and some uh, more capabilities to the lookup list. And that, now that your rules are all defined and triggered, you'd like to be able to have a security assessment of your environment. And for this, we all know the MITRE attack framework. We're going to map our rules and also the custom rules by the customers to those MITRE attacks. And uh, customers will be able to assess uh, their security posture and see tactics and techniques that, that are used in customer's environment and the gaps that are missing in the environment and maybe requests for some more rules and some more capabilities, maybe another security tool is needed. And that's about uh, the MITRE attack. And we all love integrations in the security world. And we have so many integrations and we're adding another one, and that's uh, for the Simplify. It's a SOAR tool. We're going to very, very soon uh, announce the integration with, uh, with this tool. 
So yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the MITRE ATT&CK framework in particular. It's a very popular framework. It's also very extensive. It's, it's exhaustive. Uh, and it takes a while to you know, get a product reflection of that framework really implemented right. And, and I think we're doing that. So I'm looking forward to that one. Let's talk about investigation. And you know, one of the uh, you know, first steps in an investigation typically is when you're looking at an initial compromise stage of the attack life cycle, uh, threat intelligence becomes really important for that initial part of the investigation. So Smanar, what are we doing with threat intel in 2021? So in 2021, we already were able to add some new IOC types to our offering. And I'm talking about uh, file hashes, MD5, SHA-1, SHA-256, and also user agents. Malicious uh, user agents will be detected by, uh, by our product. Um, so that will help with uh, finding malware and phishing attacks. What we're also adding is um, on top of all our sawmill parsers, and we have many of them, we are adding the sticks parser to be able to use um, external and internal threat intelligence feeds that are written in and using the STIC standard. So now that we have so many parsers available, the sawmill parser, the STIC parser, and more, we'd like uh, customers that want to add their own private feeds to be able to select the parser. As we know, feeds are actually files and they have a format. So customer would like to buy themselves as a self-service, select the feed and select the parser. We'll have this available in 2021. And so to complete uh, the threat intelligence overview, we'll have a, a page, a view of customers all, I, all fields that are being enriched. So customers can, can look and see and review all the fields that are now enriching and see if maybe something is uh, enriched by mistake or something is missing. For example, I'll look at my uh, page with all the enriched fields and I see lots of IPs, but I don't see any domains. And I know that my logs from my IPS contains domains. So I'd like to add them. This will give a much better visibility on the threat intelligence to our customers. So yeah, we're, we're adding more pre-built parsers for feeds. Uh, we already have a bunch. We have you know, hundreds of pre-built parsers for logs and log data. Uh, and, and one kind of little known fact about Logs.io as a company is that our customer support team is highly, highly technical and can turn around new log parsers in minutes. So if you add a new log type, you know, that's maybe a little exotic, uh, they, can, they can set that up for you really quickly, which enables our SecOps customers uh, and users to focus on, you know, their investigation in, in sort of real time, uh, as well as, you know, actually managing, you know, events as they happen. So, you know, speaking of event management, a lot of organizations generate a ton of security events because the attack surface is really, really complex. Uh, what are we doing in terms of event management in 2021, Smidar? So we already talked about all the rules that we have, and now customers have plenty of events and we'd like to help them manage the workload on these events, meaning uh, event is triggered, you will be able to assign an owner to handle the event, to remediate it, to investigate it, maybe to, to set the status as false positive or resolve. And all this will be, will be available from our own Cloud C platform in 2021. And I think this will be mainly um, very beneficial to uh, smaller companies or smaller um, groups uh, with uh, several uh, security analysts or, or customers that have SOC in-house, they'll be able to use it. Excellent, yeah, really useful stuff when you're in the midst of uh, you know, multi-prong investigation with a, a, lot of, a lot of team members and a lot of data points popping up. Uh, so when we talk about the cloud sim as being cloud native, that's a word that gets thrown around a lot. Uh, and for a lot of organizations, you know, to be really honest with you as a, as a technologist, 
that means that they took their on-prem stuff and put it in a VM and, you know, put it in the cloud. And now they say it's cloud native, but it's not really. Uh, when we say cloud native, we mean it. You know, it was built in the cloud area purely on cloud technologies. And a big part of that is, as we said, you know, that API first development uh, methodology and the fact that we focus so much on automation and, and programmability. So with programmability, Smidar, 2021, what, what do we have coming up? Right, so as you said, we are API first, uh, definitely. And so uh, we, we mentioned our MSSPs and uh, larger customer, but also uh, this will be beneficial for smaller customer. Everybody likes uh, to, uh, to automate. And uh, the first thing you do is create an account. And uh, you can create an account using an API, create the account, copy all the relevant content into the account, set the, the users, copy the, the rules, the dashboards, lookup list, anything, and have the account completely ready for your, if you're an MSSP, for your customer or for your security team. And on top of it, you can do it not only just from the API, but uh, add an, another layer and do it from Terraform. So that will be uh, really beneficial as creating the account automatically. And now that we have the account, we start shipping logs. And once we ship logs, either they're being parsed, maybe they're in JSON, or we already have parsers um, out of the box for this data type. But if not, we're going to add the possibility to, to create your own parser as a self-service. So Eric, you mentioned before that our support is extremely technical and they can write a sawmill parser in uh, minutes. So now customers will have a choice, either use the support and ask for a parser or do it self-service. And now that everything is in place, you have logs, the parse, the rules, the trigger, you want to start working with the platform. We're going to add an onboarding process that will really help customers onboard the product and use it uh, to the best that they can in just uh, you know a few hours. Yeah, it's all about having options. Um, you know, when you talk about a, a SaaS company, you know, the the service is the product, and, and we really think about it that way. We want you to have the option to engage with our support team, to do it yourself, uh, be self sufficient. You know, we we want to be flexible that way, and I, I think that's part of that cloud native philosophy as well. So. Sumanar, thanks very much. Uh, I, I love the transparency and I love the, the culture of transparency that we have at Logs.io. Uh, not every company is going to be as open as, as you have been with us about the product roadmap. So thanks very much for your time today. I do appreciate it. Thank you, Eric. Integrate Simplify with Logs.io Cloud Sim to gain end-to-end -end incident response all at a cost far below traditional sims. Logs.io Cloud Sim is the easiest way to consolidate, prioritize, and investigate security events in modern cloud environments, helping security teams identify risks and alert on their most significant vulnerabilities and attacks. Integrated with Simplify, Logs.io enables SOC analysts to effectively respond to and solve severe security problems. Getting started is simple. Set up the Logs.io integration from the Simplify Marketplace, activate the connector, and start ingesting your SIM events into Simplify's SOAR platform for automated investigation and response. Start automating today to shorten your investigation's mean time to resolution and augment your SOC. Kick off with the Logs.io pre-built playbook or create your own to equip your SOC with centralized evidence correlation, cross-reference multiple data sources, and capture logs, rolling back days, months, or even years. To learn more, sign up for our free trial. Well, that's a wrap for Scale Up Security 2021. I want to thank you for attending, spending some time with us today. Following the event, all sessions will be available on demand, so don't worry if you miss something in a talk. And watch for an email in your inbox with an event recap and link to all the recordings. You know, 2021 is a really big year for the Logs.io Cloud Sim, so stay tuned for future updates. We're building the fastest, most flexible, most efficient sim out there. There is so much more to come. If you want to learn more, please feel free to use the book a meeting button at the top of the page. And for our current customers, obviously feel free to reach out to your account manager.
Thanks again for joining us today.